the planet itself is now a museum. And uh, since uh, Sputnik. And uh, this is only the beginning. All other museums are now obsolete. What would you say, Marshall, about the idea that, you know, the museum as a, a, a kind of gathering point well, of what not, man why has why done? Why don't you consider the meaning of the word? <laughs> the Garden of the Muses. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the rallying of all the arts into one focal point. Oh, I would, uh, That's what the uh, word means. Yeah, of course. Uh, do you know the uh, comment that uh, Peter Swan made about this thing in Toronto when uh, Sam Zaks bought up the whole uh, collection of Henry Moore? Of Henry Moore. Uh, Peter Swan's comment was, Modern sculpture? <laughs> Would rather when Sam Zaks offered him two of the Moors. Like any curator, he will never be yeah. seen dead with a living work of art. That's right. This is my comment, actually. The curators are people who live with dead art and wouldn't be caught dead with living art. And this just seems to be a kind of faithful idea in the museum world. However, the um, museum concept is a consumer concept. It is not an art concept. And uh, art is for the sake of uh, opening uh, doors of perception. And museums are for the opposite purpose of closing That's the doors right. of perception. Yeah. Well, museums are totally dedicated to the idea of the object, per se, you know, the object. Classified not. and packaged. That's right. That's yeah. The object not as a means of perception. Well, Marshall, I've watched them. But as a take, package deal. Yeah. I have watched them take a beautiful thing and put a number on it and put it up in the attic. But remember, this At is... At that point, they've solved the problem. Right, Harley, but, <laughs> by the way, Tony, are we recording? Yes. Okay, uh, let's go. You know, we can, let's go. We can edit now, it later. The other Tony night, will edit it later. The other night on, uh, uh, was it Channel 13 or one of the uh, current shows, they had a, a magnificent story of our uh, auctioning of modern art. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they encountered the problem of the genuine fake the work of art that is so beautifully faked that uh, most experts are taking him. And from the point of view of the auctioneer, these are the obscenities that must be destroyed. Because they uh, bring drag down the value yeah. of the genuine works. Now, as they went on to say, this of course has nothing to do with the artist. And uh, the, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a work of art is faked, to the point where it has uh, genuine structure and means of awakening perception to form, then obviously it performs the same function as the original and has the same value as the original. And its monetary or market value is totally irrelevant. But this is not the way the museum collector or classifier would observe uh, such an object. That's it right. never occurred to these people that uh, these objects have a function beyond that of classified, packaged, mm -hmm. excellence. Well, of course, this came up uh, with uh, Van Meegeren during the war, where Van Meegeren sold uh, these Vermeers to uh, the Nazi hierarchy, um, and he just sat up in an attic and uh, painted them. Then, at the end of the war, what happened was they slapped him in jail for a legal enterprise of some kind or another, and uh, he said to them, look, I wasn't trading in Vermeers. I was trading in faked Vermeers. And he was not reproducing yeah. works that Vermeer had ever painted. That's right. And he was creating new Vermeers. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody being punished for writing new Shakespearean plays that Shakespeare had never thought of. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What would happen, actually? It's a tremendous idea. What would happen if somebody... Well, it, it, it did happen, actually. Uh, remember early English, remember the tremendous farce, uh, the tremendous fraud of somebody producing very, very early English literature. I don't know if you know about this. Do you remember? Yes, in the 18th century, there was quite a big um, um, lot of faking of early Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. <laughs> of course, to the 20th century scholar's eye, it was not a very good fake. But um, 
the kind of antiquarianism took on a tremendous new meaning about um, the 18th century. The first big consumer age. Yeah, I think this is, uh, of course, the, the whole thing is... Classification and yeah. collection of antiquities. Package and not process. Package and not process. And also antiquities. Yeah. The idea of the mildewed object being far superior to anything current. Mm -hmm. This, uh, of course, went along with the romantic interest in ruins and in primitivism. Osh, McPherson's Oshin was a colossal fake of Celtic antiquities, yeah. mm -hmm. which uh, even got Napoleon all excited. He was a fan of this fake uh, mm -hmm. Gaelic masterpiece. Mm -hmm. Fingal's Cave. By the way, you've got yourself a swell set of overtones, Carlos. Like vibrations in the Holy cow! Listen to the vibration of that truck, eh? <laughs> well, anyway, museums make, uh, when Hardy and I once sat down to wait for some curator to come to our, our rescue in a museum, where was that time? Uh, New York. At the, uh, at no, at the Museum of uh, Natural Science. Uh, and we said, all right, Harley. I said, all right, Harley, you know that everyone who enters a museum suddenly gets claustrophobia. Uh, now, why? Why is this horrible shut-in feeling suddenly assail uh, the uh, human sensibilities in a museum? Let's work it out. We got a few minutes. And so we just sat there and chatted about it. We solved the problem in three or four minutes. And the reason is this, and the concerns are on the very heart of our matter. Museums are laid out in a continuous visual space. Connected space. They have a, like a storyline at a World's Fair. You've got a route to follow. The artifacts have no relationship. The to artifacts this space. themselves are iconic, each making its own world, and has they have nothing to do with the space in which they're exhibited. This is the big the problem. clash between the iconic spaces created by the artifacts and the visual spaces in which they're set creates a horrible trauma in the viewer. You see, there is a dichotomy here between. The whole idea of space as something into which you put things. You create the space and you put things in it. That's what museums are. But this is not true about most of the cultures of the world. Because what happens in most cultures is that you have the object and it creates its own space. Well, for example, until Newton's time, it was assumed by all mankind that the eye was a broadcasting system that created the outer world that we saw. The apple of the eye was that center from which emerged all the images that created the outer world. This is the meaning of the phrase, the apple of the eye. In the psalmist, the psalmist says to God, keep me in the apple of thine eye. Uh, keep me in the old, uh, keep me on the program. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep me in existence. Don't scrub me off that there tape, please. The apple of the eye was the broadcasting center. Come Newton or afterwards, people suddenly reversed this and began to think of the eye as a reception center. Not as a mm -hmm. making center, but as a matching, matching center. center. Mm -hmm. Now, in all other societies, this eye, the idea of the eye as a making, a maker of space, and a maker of the outside world applies to all the other senses as well. The ear and touch and all these senses create their own spaces and their own worlds also. Smell. But the idea of man as a mere consumer, the tabula rasa, came in in the 18th century. The idea that man was merely a container for sensations that poured into him. Yeah. I think this is apropos, Marshall, of my, uh, my theory about déjà vu. The déjà vu thing has been thought about for a long time. As At some point or another, you have two cows in a field with grass or something or another, and this reminds you of something about two cows. And it isn't true. I'm, I'm postulating at this point that 
A déjà vu is a reconstruction, an exact correspondence of the orchestration of the senses at some point or another. It has nothing to do with content. It has to do with the fact that uh, the olfactory, the touch, the eye are in a certain ratio. This is what déjà vu is about. It's also kind of rearview mirror. Oh yeah, but it's situations that uh, match. Well, mirror is a bad word there because this is just the visual immediately. You see, I don't think it's a. It's a. If you think about the uh, the total sensorium and you think about the possibility oh, of reorchestration of that, I take it that you're part of this dialogue. For heaven's sake, let's make it a dialogue. Eh? I, I'm, I'm interested in the. Let me just get over here with you on this. Presley says something very interesting. Before you started talking, before you said we're on tape, you two were talking in the perfect manner for stereo. Okay. In that you were rubbing up against each other, uh -huh. which just is, is so exciting. It calmed down a little when you said we're talking for tape, and you sure. became more interested in the content of what you were saying to some degree. Well, yeah. we've begun mm -hmm. to... Then you came back to it very okay. nicely. We'll get back. Hey, hey, we're on air. We're on the air, as it were. Tell this me. is confusing. Yeah, I don't have this. All right. I couldn't care less whether I'm on tape, right. you know? Well, I'm, I'm conscious of these... Uh, Environmental sounds. By the way, the word environment is a very important word for your purpose. Caravallo, eh? Caravallo. Greek word means to hit from all sides at once. That's environment. It's a number. All right, let me, let me ask several questions in relation to this. The museums are, more ob are becoming more and more obsolete and yet more crowded. No, just a moment. They're changing completely. They're taking in more and more of the cultural field in which the artifacts originally were created. They're paying less and less attention to mere classification. Anthropology has increasingly taken on this ecological scope, the total field of operation in which the objects were used and made. Whereas this, this is new and this is uh, far more satisfactory in terms of perception well, Ted was remarking the other day, Ted Carpenter was remarking the other day that what had happened was that the film has just totally outmoded all the past archaeology, anthropological, yeah. anthropological descriptions, descriptions in, uh, in terms of type, and, you know, in terms of writing. Because the um, natives themselves are now permitted to make uh, movies of their own rituals, their own daily lives, of their own methods of making, weaving, and cooking, and so on. And they don't correspond to anything the anthropologists have seen. Have ever seen before, or have ever written before. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ted tells about the uh, film that was made by these people. They merely described, uh, are they... What they did was, they got an old woman who had been making what Rug. rugs all her life, you know. Indian and have all Yeah, and uh, they got her to make a film of it. They showed her how to run a camera, you know. She had never seen a film. Never seen a film. Taught her how to run a camera, and she moved in. And the result was this: that uh, she used the eye of the camera as a kind of finger was concerned with the whole tactile bit of making these yeah, kind of rugs. And it was a totally new kind of film, suddenly. It's, whereas the Westerner or the, the illiterate man uses the camera as an eye that looks at an operation. The native uses it, uses it as, a, as a hand. Yeah, and of course one of the things inherent in the technology of television is that it is a scanning finger, not an eye, that produces well, Let's come back uh, to the... Uh, museum thing. I think we've done our bit by the museum world, haven't we? But they have moved from mere classification of antiquities to increasing ecological concern with scope, environment on which the objects were used or developed, purposes for which they were originally used. I would say the direction is there, yeah. 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 For example, the, the igloo uh, was, is a very recent object in Eskimo culture. It doesn't go back very far, the white man was responsible for it. 
Um, it was a prima stove, wasn't it? Prima stove. Prima stove made yeah. it possible to live in these ice cubes. Um, but it also created the uh, situation whereby there was a lot of drip from the roofs of the siglo. So the, the Eskimos took to pasting magazine pages over the sides of the siglo. And this led the anthropologist to crane his neck uh, vigorously around so he could see these pages. This sent the Iga, the natives, or the Eskimos, into fits of laughter. They could see just as easily upside down or sideways as from side up. The idea that these miserable anthropologists couldn't see except right side up just yeah. entertained them endlessly. Well, uh, Ted tells a story, actually, that uh, he was in this kind of an environment where there were photographs from life or from whatever from time and so on, upside down. And Ted no. sort of stood and put his head down between his legs, you know, and sort of he could see right side up on these things. And apparently the Eskimo kids um, imitated him for days and found this hilarious, you know. And they all went, or all the Eskimo kids went around with their heads between their legs looking at upside down things. But, you know, but there is no upside down in Eskimo art. Nor in child art. If you were, if you have on the wall here pictures that are slightly askew or upside down, you'll automatically crane your neck to, to uh, enable to be able to see them. But children don't have to do this, and natives don't have to do it. They see them exactly as they are from any angle. However, in terms of the museum as a um, a situation, an, a humanly prepared situation, I draw, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that with Sputnik, as you put an information environment around the planet. The planet itself becomes a museum object, which can be photographed from other space. Right. And the first photographs from the moon have revealed that there's no life on the planet. No life possible on the planet. This is what the photographs from the moon say. It's impossible to have life on Earth. You know, just isn't there. It's like the old man. <laughs> Has anyone made that statement? <laughs> yes. Oh, official yes. Official report. Yeah. Uh, but it's like the statement of uh, the metaphysical story question. Is there a life before death? <laughs> Well, I think we've done our bit by the I think you've done beautifully. Just let's turn to the real business. Fine. What what do we have on the agenda? You can just keep going. And, uh, well, we have uh, these two slides. These uh, two slides and the dolly. Uh, we, uh, we can talk about. It. You don't have a TV guide. This no, but I could run out and get one. No, no, you can't. It's last week's. Oh, it's specific one. No, it's don't. June 8th. Nope, and believe me, it's <coughs> Dali's greatest picture. Well, I know it by heart. Mm -hmm. I have it carefully brought it with me, and uh, thanks to the mess I've lived through in the last few The Aldemiro one and the Buffalo one first. The Buffalo one first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Surah is a different thing. Yeah, okay. um, I'm going to take off. <laughs> Ah. No. Well, it might move to the. Uh, uh, it's not upside down. It might move to the left. Oh, no, it moves to the right, I think. Before we start recording on this, what do you think is the optimum time? 30 minutes? Optimum time for what? A usable half hour disk. Let's not worry about that. Let's decide that afterwards. Let's get our information. Oh, we've got handless information. You go for hours. All right, go for... No, no, but no, we don't. We, I, I, my, my... I say go for the half hour. Then. That's but the point is this. Uh, are we to imagine that our points will be dubbed and edited later to the advantage of the hero? That you'll be able to provide other effects... Well, I, I or will there be just our voices? I would say that depends on what you're talking about. Well, you see, we're talking, that, well yes. for example, if suppose we're talking, about, as we will be talking about tactile space, which is the space of the interval, and which therefore concerns music. One could then illustrate it Good. in various other okay. forms. So, in, I think you'll find that many of the spaces we talk about will be capable of auditory effects, mm -hmm. and therefore you could. We wouldn't have to talk for half an hour for a half hour disc, that's what I'm saying. Um, 
Harley and I have this book coming out called Space and Poetry and Painting. <coughs> and I, we don't have the uh, text of the poems with us. Anyhow. I could have brought those too. I yeah. didn't realize we needed them. But, yeah, I'm, yeah, you mentioned it, and I said no, but I... See, we have Esco uh, primitive poems that go with the primitive spaces. And, uh, well, I can remember some of them, Marshall. Yeah, well, we'll use them, yeah. as we remember. Mm -hmm. But they are very much like contemporary poetry. The Ferengetti world is very much like that of the Eskimo Fair form. Composy Concret is very much like that of the old primitive poetry. And for the same reason. So we'll mention that. Yeah. Um, but we're going to, we, you see, in this book, we move through the spaces from primitive man to the present in both media, poetry, and painting, or language and other plastic arts. Mr. Leo, he's calling right now. I'll see if I can interrupt him. Cool. What's on? John Leo from the New York Times is asking for more support. Cut him off, Marshall. Tell him to call back. Mr. Leo, he's right in the midst of recording. Can you call back in about a half an hour or so? Thank you. Yeah. Well, 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 One of the greatest lines well, well, comes. Well, well, Sorry, you don't want to be interrupted about that. Oh, no. 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 Well, one of the greatest lines that comes out of primitive poetry uh, is out of the one in Eskimo, the, Mar uh, that, uh, the Ted quotes. Enerka. Enerka. Which means the breath of life. Yeah. And one of the greatest lines that comes out of it, which uh, absolutely describes the business of... Will you please make a note of it as you talk? Write it down. I mean, write it down so that we can refer to it as we record. Oh, I see. No, I think we're recording right now, Marsh. Oh, no, we haven't begun. Yeah, I have the tape on. The, the tape is on. Oh, I made it. And uh, you can... to line this up a bit. Well, I, well, okay, line it up. That's fine. One of the greatest lines, though, Marshall, is, My house is made large by my guests. Remember this line? Tremendous. The number of your guests doesn't decrease the size of your house. It makes it bigger, you know? And this is the business of things creating spaces. Uh, Harley, we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to raise our voices. I'm sorry, I'm bothering you. Let's, I'm, no, yeah, no, it's yeah. just, let's let's chat. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're not yeah. lecturing. And uh, and I mean, we we want it that way. We don't want vehemence. No, I was just remarking though that that, yeah. that line, oh, yeah. my house is made large by my guests, is tremendous in terms of a recreation of the whole concept of space. What about the line of uh, Sweeney Agnes? He's like, God ah. use words when I talk to you, which is a way of saying that uh, the language of the body of gesture is far richer than language. Is mm -hmm. uh, used by a person who is um, endowed with the mimetic power. Anyway, um, we want to uh, get really a number of discs, Tony, out of this book and um, put it, you know, as it were, and make it available, as it were, on, on disc. And after all, there are the texts, the paintings, and the poems. And uh, the uh, audience can buy the book and look at the poems and the paintings and have our commentary as it goes. So we start with cave painting. Uh, we start with the Anurka thing. Yeah. And, uh, and cave poetry. Um, because uh, here is a space that is uh, very little modified by human technologists. Mm. It's a space that involves the whole sensorium and was yeah. never intended to be looked at. That's right. Well, of course, the whole world of the Eskimo is one of largely non-visual speeches. But uh, the oh. Altamira well it represents a world of a parallel <laughs> plastic arts that were never intended to be seen by the human eye. They were done in the dark and in places where people were never expected to enter again. Well, it's Gideon the Husu who makes this point, actually, that he had to crawl literally crawl through all kinds of caverns to finally arrive at the point where the cave drawings were in and Spain. They were not only difficult of access, many of them painted under shelves of rock 
it's utterly inaccessible. Uh, many of them uh, painted on very rough surfaces or uneven surfaces. Mm -hmm. And many of them painted many layers deep over each other. The mm -hmm. art of photography has completely falsified the world of the cave painting. Oh, well, and that happened before that, uh, uh, Marshal Ratchie. Uh, the Abbe Bruyl in the 19th century, uh, you know, imposed a 19th century visual realism upon these rock paintings, you know, which didn't exist, but he falsified it in that way. Well, they were never intended to be representations of anything. They were intended to affect operations going on in the outer world in a voodoo or magical way. That's pattern. right. That's right. So they were operational objects, very much like those that come off the drafting boards of Madison Avenue uh, advertising agencies. The closest parallel to the cave painter is the Madison Avenue ad, 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 ad agency, uh, whose work is not intended to sharpen the perceptions of the viewer, nor to represent anything uh, so much as to influence the will and purposes of the purchasing public. It is intended to have a magical effect upon the motives of a hidden audience. And so there is an amazing parallel between Madison Avenue and Altamira. And uh, this, I, this is of course amusing and ironic. But it also draws attention to the fact that uh, the greatest art of the 20th century in any quantitative whole uh, plenary sense is the art of the advertiser. That by far the most ingenious and, and inventive art forms have come from the advertising world and perhaps the cartoonists of the 20th century rather than from the professional painters. And this uh, is, uh, well, perhaps magnificently illustrated in that Salvador Dali painting recently on the cover of TV Guide for June 8. Where he it's says the thumbs bit, he says, well, he says, you know, what happens actually is that he takes the, the thumbs and he puts them into a kind of a desert and he, they said, what kind of desert is this? He says, this Dali Desert. This is where it occurs. So yesterday you were asked, do you mean the, the Newton Minnow Wasteland? TV Wasteland? Yeah. Oh! Mm. That's <laughs> the Dali. Desert. The Dali Desert. And what he does is suggest that the TV screens are, well, there are images on the two thumbs. Yeah. The thumbnails. The thumbnails. Are yeah. uh, TV screens, yeah. Yeah, they're TV screens. He says exactly the right shape for TV screens. Thumbs. And the thumbs are represented very coarse textures, very, very tight. Yeah, with no relationship to a hand, incidentally. I mean, they just yeah. come, they just rise out. You know, and you... they are a considerable distance apart, mm -hmm. indicating tactile space, which is the space of the integral. Yeah, the, uh, and I think we can move in there on this, on the statement of, uh, who was it who said to the blind, all things are separate. Alec Layton, the anthropologist Alec Layton. pointed out yeah. that touch in the world of the blind is not a continuum, does not reveal to the blind person a continuum, such as the sighted encounter, but a world of discontinuities and sudden breakthroughs yeah. and suddenness of perception. Touch is not a world in which there is any continuity. But of course this is true of sight, of, of hearing and uh, smell and, and uh, movement too. Yeah, you can say actually that uh, the, only, the only sense really that is uh, connected is the sighted one. This allows the concept of continuity and uh, perspective and backwards and forwards. And None of the other senses this, do this. Uh, this sense extended to time and the organization of human effort creates the civilized world. The tribal man lives in no such space. He lives in acoustic space. Uh, which is a world in which sensation of sound comes from all directions simultaneously. It's a total sphere without center and without margins. This is the space of radio, of the telegraph press. It's a mosaic all at once. It's a continuous world, no connections in a newspaper between any two items. 
but there is a date line. There's the immediacy of involvement in now. And this is the uh, space of tribal man and of electric man. Do you remember the story the anthropologist told us, I've forgotten his name, in Toronto, who said he was working with Bushmen or somebody, some little tribe, and uh, he took one of these characters out in a jeep and he drove him through the forest where the man lived and he took him down onto the plains and when he got down after a day or so he found that off to the left about two or three miles away there was a herd of buffalo the natives said what are those kind of insects over there because the native had never seen more than about 30 feet away from himself before living totally in the forest he had absolutely and completely no sense of perspective so the idea that off across that belt there there could be some well the eye sees all things uh, right up against the face in any of that oh yes and this is where the child is when yeah. people recover sight after uh, yeah. long yeah. years of blindness when they're by some operation they're allowed to see again the whole world is a, is a buzzing, wilder confusion That's right. of immediate sensations stuck right in front of their eyes. All colors, all sorts right. of objects, all messed up. But right in. Page right 51 in. of Otto Lowenstein's book, The Senses, reports this in detail and is a, a simply a thrilling account. Really, how we see, unaided by other senses, the eye itself, merely unaided by the other senses, can see only flat up against the face. Um, but to come back to the Dali thing, part, yeah. uh, he was drawing attention to the fact that TV is not a visual medium, that it is tactile. That's right. Well, stress on the fingernail and the touch, the thing that, of the, the scanning of the finger of the yeah. TV image is an iconic device mm -hmm. that renders objects in structural outline and process rather than in photographic realism. And hence the involvement, also the rear projection. But that we're anticipating a little bit of Surah there. Another feature, though, of the film, if we've read of uh, the uh, Salvador Dali uh, TV uh, picture, up in the right hand corner, there's a bit of brain tissue. It looks like a little can of worms. Drawing attention to the fact that in the electric environment, there in the electric environment, we put our nervous system outside. And uh, Dali sees this quite clearly and manifests it by putting the brains, a portion of the human brains, right on the environmental horizon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, software, the electric information environment of software, is made of our own nervous systems. And it creates a new type of environment. Shall we pause, Tony? No, I was had hurry to go outside. Uh, the, uh, the amazing thing about the electronic man or the TV generation is that it lives in a world of software. Okay. It lives in a world of software created by its own nervous system as an environment. Whereas up till electricity, people lived in a world of hardware. Artifacts that extended portions of their bodies, but not their nerves. And uh, the coming of the software environment, it creates the upsets for the ordinary civilized man. The TV generation has its personal image scrubbed or wiped away by this new software and when it encounters the old hardware it regards the hardware as the enemy the thing that has caused this loss of identity mm -hmm. but that aspect of TV as tactile is very difficult to get people to recognize because they think anything they can see must have all the characteristics of visual space or a uniform continuous connected space Euclidean and so on yeah. space of literate land remember the quote I discovered some time back that uh, Leonardo da Vinci used he said seeing is believing and he, but he did not quote the rest of it 
which is Just healing. Seeing is believing, but to touch is the word of God. God's own truth. God's own truth, you say. Yeah. Hmm. The touch is God's own truth. Well, the idea of that touch involves all the senses and is therefore the most profoundly involving of experiences. Oh, well, you know, bio uh, you know, biologically, I mean, you can prove this fact that in the developing fetus, uh, the initial sensibility of the fetus is totally a ganglia, which is nothing but touch. And as the fetus develops, it moves out to these specialized receptors, like receptors like eye, ear, and so on. And kinesis. Yeah, and kinesis. But initially, it is nothing but touch. Which is totally involving. So the uh, TV generation is one that is profoundly involved and totally lacking in powers of detachment, objectivity, or direction, or goal orientation. Right. We could even talk about Hearst at this point, Marshall. You know, Dr. Her Marshall and I, some years back, wrote a little thing which was never published called Why the TV Child Can't See Ahead. Because we were involved at that point with a, guy, uh, with a chap named Arthur Hearst, Dr. Hearst. And uh, he had discovered that the near point reading thing bit had come down to the point where children wrote, I think, at four and a half inches and observed a book at six inches. And they also discovered that uh, as much as stereopsis is impossible at six inches, the best readers in the class, I think it was grade three or four, the best readers were kids who were psychologically blinding one eye because stereopsis uh, was impossible. You can't focus on this. Uh, then he investigated in Texas in 1942 and discovered that uh, the near point reading distance in Texas at that point was the classical one, elbow to ulna. Uh, and then he began to, he presented the problem to us at the center as to why, what is happening here? Why are the kids pulling the book? right up to their faces. And Marshall and I postulated some time back, have you ever tried to walk between a small diaper kid and a TV screen? You know, he's right up there. So the children are trying to get that same involvement. And quality of involvement that they get from the TV screen out of the book. This obviously demands a reorganization or a re design and redevelopment of the whole concept of what is a book. Typography yeah. needs to be quite different for a TV child. That's right. Has to take on the of course, this is what we're doing in Counterblast. In Counterblast, this is exactly what we're doing in this book. Typography has to take on the character of a poster. <laughs> but um, the, the apropos of the uh, Salvador Dali painting, his awareness that TV is touch and the touch is interval, oh. not connection. Mm -hmm. And hence the world of the gap mm -hmm. brings in the whole musical phase of beat. Beat is touch. Beat creates interval. Interval demands closure. Closure creates rhythm. So the whole mm -hmm. world of music is ta audio tactile in the clo endless repetitive closing of gaps created by beat, up or down. Now this kind of a relation then between audile and tactile space is one which the beat generation, the rock generation, the uh, whole hippie generation, the uh, sitar, shankar syndrome, all of these things show that Western man has lost his visual orientation. That's right. Mm -hmm. He's going inward. But this happened in the world of painting in the later 19th century. That's right. Well, in the, in the uh, world of painting, of course, what we know uh, about uh, Japanese or Chinese painting is the stress was on the interval, not on the incident, but on the interval. And uh, Chinese painting, for example, has what the Western world would regard as vast spaces, which are in which there is nothing. Uh, well, the art of uh, flower arrangement in Japan yeah. consists in spaces. Uh -huh. but I remember Takamura telling us that a Japanese housewife, when 
irritated with her husband, would never dream of verbalizing her grievance. She merely rearranges the flowers. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> think, you know. But anyway, about this, uh, I can quote the, the, the thing. Uh, Bless the Beatles for reaffirming that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. There you go. <laughs> and that's after very apt to one. The beat. The beat. Sure. Is, uh, the beat -nick, what's the old saying? The beat -nick is a uh, rat. No. No. No, the beat -nick, beat nick is a something that is chicken out of the rat race. That's right. He's a cat who's the chicken out of the rat race. He's a cat that is chicken out of the rat race. But. Surah, your favorite. No, well, Surah, yeah, well, I... Uh, Apropos TV. Yeah. Well, of course, Surah, um, by using uh, uh, his, uh, his techniques of divisionism and pointillism and so on, uh, what he did was totally anticipate uh, quadricolor reproduction and the whole bit of the technology of television, of color television. He was painting television decades before the one... That's right, in 1892. Paul Clay was painting TV aerials decades before TV. You know, calling them whistling machines and so That's on. That's right. Forgot uh, what? Mozart and Bach were uh, programming the Industrial Revolution by their metronomic beats mm -hmm. a century before mechanical industry got rolling. And um, all artists anticipate the so called realities by decades mm. simply because they live in the now. Was it Wyndham Lewis who said art? is a detailed history of the future because the artist is the only person who lives in the present. Mm -hmm. If you know how to see the present or sense the present, you can anticipate the future quite easily. The future of the future is the present, in other words. Yeah, another way of saying it is uh, that most men look at the past, extrapolate it into the present under the illusion that they're looking at the future. When Don Quixote was, became saturated with the new products of Gutenberg technology, medieval romances got into print right away. He uh, rode off madly into the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. seeking the enemy way, way back there. Uh, well, maybe, Marshall, we could uh, talk uh, briefly of this idea of abrasion. You know, historic of interface. Yeah, of interface, and the fact that uh, historically you can find that the periods of greatest creativity lie when uh, or occur when one culture comes up against another. Uh, I remember our thing on Hieronymus Bosch, fifteenth uh, century, where he's in the medieval thing, and he what he did actually was he painted or or he created the space of Renaissance times, which is a proscenium arch stage. And then he people did... A real container. Yeah, a real container. But then what he did was to people it with a kind of... Uh, or to medieval put in icons. kind of mic medieval icons and all these strange monsters that he and put in there. And created sheer horror. That's right. The same thing happened when Kafka... Uh, you know... The metamorphosis. The metamorphosis thing. He, what he did was create... A very little mundane space in which the little clerk went down to work every day, and Kafka uh, Kaf creates this space very carefully, and then suddenly the little clerk turns into a cockroach. The metamorphosis the same thing. Of, yeah. uh, of interface, one culture against another. That's right. At the present time, one of the greatest interfaces of all time, the uh, new electric software interfacing with the old 19th century hardware. Or the old um, Greek or Roman hardware, as far as that goes. The book is hardware. Um, this interface creates such a loss of identity that the um, Kafka thing uh, seems rather uh, trivial. Oh, yeah, but I mean, he was our writing quite a long while back. You know? Our children today are uh, dedicated to the proposition that the, uh, the individual must cease. That private life and private identity as an evil thing must be wiped out. And um, they take um, severe uh, measures to attain this stand by right. chemicals and uh, by various mm -hmm. aesthetic uh, regimen. Um, 
this uh, desire, this is no prim the, remember the sentimental primitivism of the, uh, say, the Thoreau period. The mere nostalgic looking back to a tribal past is now a recreation in furious actuality of plenary tribalism by our own TV youngsters. The uh, meaning of civilized, individual, private, detached, motivated, goal-directed man finished as far as they're mm -hmm. concerned. They live a lives of horror in a world of hardware which they never made while surrounded by worlds of software and information which they have made but they didn't know they put it there. Shakespeare's famous phrase about one touch of nature makes the whole world kin has a very sinister meaning. The phrase really goes, one touch of nature makes the whole world kin that all with one consent pursue newborn gods, G-A-U-D-S, and give to dust that is a little guilt more praise than guilt or dusted. Any fancy bit of fuzz will gain more of their eulogy than the real thing that men have never had the power to face reality they've always been taken in by the dusty showy guilt covered object <laughs> that uh, humankind as I just said can bear a very little reality well, well this is a part of uh, your remark actually that uh, no one sees his environment, right? Same thing? Joyce's phrase for it is at the top of page 81 in Finnegan. As for the viability of econos, they are, when invisible, invincible. The econol or the environment, when unperceived, which is the normal yeah. state of such environments, yeah. exercises an invincible tyranny over the human sensorium. It twists and distorts every mode of perception without people even knowing what hit them. That's right, but this then is the function of the artist to... The artist's job is to untangle right. that mess and to give clear images yeah. oh. of what is really going on in the environment. Uh, so that the artist uh, actually at that point has a tremendous sociological uh, oh. function, sure. Survival function. Without him, yeah. Let me stop, Jester. So here it is. This is McLuhan two years later in Tony Schwartz's studio again. The date is June 20th, 68. Okay. So a whole batch of their spatial orientations, uh, their horror of maps and of street signs, etc., etc., which, incidentally, is characteristic of a great deal of New York. Okay. I want to just say what Tony really says. I want to show you something. At least I want to yeah. show you. Yeah. What something of a concept. I'm saying I want to show, I want you to see this. Do you see what I mean? Oh, yes. That's the context. Yeah. The moment, I want to show it. The moment, I want you to see what I mean. The moment of truth, of course, is not visual at all. It's just a blinding flash that knocks you for a loop. And uh, all the senses. All the senses. Because the other one is unhorses you. I want to show you a sort of a, a dispassionate survey. Now, will you please stand back and take a look at this? Because I want to show you. No. From my viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. From my viewpoint. From my viewpoint, I want to show you. So that uh, the other thing, the epiphany, the instant revelation is I equate total the word sensory. See with perceive. And perception has to do with all the senses and not seeing. Well, I mean, in the sense that. But don't you know how often people say, but do you feel it? Do you, do you really get it? I don't think you're getting it. You know, this feeling meaning uh, it, uh, you can see it, but are you getting it? And uh, this uh, digging it, you see the new term, dig it, man, uh, means all the senses. Yeah, uh, I think we might take a moment to uh, do a little uh, survey of our situation here and, uh, and view of what we ought to be doing uh, in uh, next uh, time or two. Um, the uh, we uh, I think that there's something to be said, Tony, for going. What we do with poems and paintings is to follow the evolution of space from through the Middle Ages, Renaissance, Baroque, then the 19th century discovery or the 18th century discovery of realis realism, and uh, like Constable and Hogarth, 
and then the Dickensian type of realism. And then uh, we get into the 19th century with, uh, with romantic... With prism. romantic paintings. And I think the romantic period actually would be a very interesting one to handle. Who was it? What is Anger it? we have and the various people. Uh, Remember, who is the fellow we read? Uh, the, the Sublime and the Beautiful. Remember this distinction? In oh, yes, Lessing. Lessing. No, it wasn't Lessing. It was no, Lessing. Just not. Well, that's Burke on the Sublime Burke. and the Beautiful. That's right, Burke. Yeah. But Lessing was on the, uh, his uh, romantic uh, back view of classical art. That's the Laocoon thing. The Laocoon. But the, uh, we have, you see, all this, we do this fairly careful spatial analysis of the stages of Renaissance discovery, first of single visual space, then the Baroque discovery of dual visual space. They discover simultaneously the point of view of the sitter or the viewer and the, and the light source. They use tw two, two points of view in, in their work. The light source as a point of view and the viewer as a point of view, which cre creates that weird aura of the Caravaggios, that haunting quality. You, you endow the object with an aura by giving the light source the authority of the viewer. And uh, so we have, we have some pretty exciting stuff, and it comes out in the poetry and the painting beautifully, uh, uh, simultaneously. But I don't know how much of it we should use. Do you think we ought to do a, a whole I don't run? I what the, the purpose of the record as such is it to support the visual things you no, I think the object is to allow the uh, as much as possible to create a um, platitude that will stand on its own bottom or sit on its own side and um, be or usable there on its own table. And um, that was one of the crazy metaphors last night in this round table. The, uh, I let Mr. Kennedy have the floor. You know, <laughs> these guys <laughs> using, <laughs> using uh, uh, you know, a, a microphone and talking about giving guys more floor space. <laughs> but um, I think uh, the object is to reveal as much as possible as, 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 as we can. Uh, now, don't you think, Tony, that if you may listen to these tapes, that you will think of sound effects that could amusingly... Um, Enhance. I think in certain places, yes, and other places, uh, other places, no. Okay. Yes, in certain places, I and I think a great deal of it you can just throw out. Uh, but the idea is to. After we have a book coming out, the reader, reader I can uh, have the have these uh, flyers. Uh, the after it's an educational book. It's intended for schools, colleges, and everybody. Uh, the planters uh, could have at least the same audience as the book. But they are a, a more informal enrichment, actually. Why, are you, why are you making something for the schools if the schools aren't going to be here? <coughs> no, just <not. laughs> The uh, education has become the biggest business in the world. Software. Yes. software. Yes. The hard schools are hardware. Yes, but... but the, new, the new education is software. Just electric circuits. Just electric circuits. Oh, I mean electric information as recorded here, as uh, broadcast by radio and TV. No, 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 this isn't hardware anymore. Uh, that which is tied to circuitry is not hardware. This is because it's an extension of the nervous system. Oh, no, it's an extension of our nervous system. No, you, in, a, in a certain de de degree, yes, but you can see that it's possible eventually to dispense with it and have the image without that little box. Uh, is the yeah, because you crank, used to crank it. No, I mean, as, it became, as it became electric, it, look, most technology is hybrid. Did you ever know that the internal combustion engine was a mixture of gunpowder and electric circuit? The old musket, the, the explosions in the cylinders were based on the old musket, crossed with electric firing systems. Now that's hybrid. Most technology is hybrid. This is hybrid. That's hybrid. 
Uh, our schools will continue to be hybrid, except that they have uh, books are hardware. Print technology is hardware. Uh, the photograph can be an, uh, a hybrid in so far as it uses electric means. I'm curious, why do you call the book hardware? Because Gutenberg technology, movable types, is the, is the prototype, the very matrix of all assembly lines. You'd never have had a motor car without Gutenberg. And furthermore, of course, the book allows for the dispassionate kind of survey on it, which separates it from being literally an extension of that. This is an extension. The book is not. The, uh, the cultural attitude toward the book was that it was a separate thing. Just as for five or six hundred years, all art was a separate thing. Yeah, but it was not part of life. You spoke of art as if it had some... See, you can say this, I'm just trying to understand this, you can say this is an extension of man in that it's taking anyone's ear in no. Europe that's going to hear you no. to that point. And well, his ear is now there and we can, through the record, transfer what he can hear. Well, the telegraph, to to the, the telegraph extends our nervous system. All, all electric, our nervous system is electric, you see. Software, because the moment you return to the auditory, you're in software. They're preprint. They're pre-technology. They harp. Is reading of the book. The book Allowed. Becomes Allowed becomes the talking page becomes software. Sure, because the recipient mind is highly involved in this in a very different way than the book. The harp, the the, the, the Pete Seegers software. Oh, well. the, hardware being the, no. and the, software being the, the software is a term from computer technology. It never came in before to a computer. They mean programming, environmental programming by so certain. It isn't really content. Though. The, 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 of the, the programming. But the programming tends to go over hybrid style over other media, as, for example, movies on TV. That's hybrid. Movies are hardware. TV is software. The camera, the shutter, hardware. TV has no, no shutter, no hardware. So how are you using the word hardware and software? Oh, hardware just means... A visually organized spaces, visually organized technology, technology. fragmented. Hardware is fragmentation. Uh, the uh, electric is integral. Software. Specialist. The uh, hardware is specialist. Software is involving. Total. Integral. Uh, the integral d d d uh, dissolves. Oh, now you say the radio is uh, is. Uh, system. It's electric software. Or, uh, yes, but you spoke of radio not being as involving as, say, the TV. No, you step up the sound. Uh, radio tends to permit a high intensity of sound, the high definition of sound. And when you get uh, the higher the definition of the image, the closer you go to track record. Now, in, so uh, how is music today is becoming hardware? No. Uh, because you pluck instruments. You sing, you relate it to the voice, the spoken word again. It's becoming an auditory, acoustic, uh, acoustically oriented music exactly. as opposed to a press oriented That's music. That's right. You're going back to Homer. Pre literate. Literacy is hardware. Handwriting. That's hardware on parchment. It's fragmentation, specialism. I was listening to some tapes of Alan Lomax the other day. A primitive dance rhythms and so on. And these apparently are quite extemporaneous. Yeah. Why don't we put this on? Why don't we run through this? Uh, we just uh, been through with you, Tommy. The difference between hardware and software. And you raising the questions. All right. I, I have... Uh, okay. Because I think that's very important for the uh, listener. Yes, I agree. Uh, do you want to sit back or else let me move the microphone? You want to move now, you just raise a batch of questions about hardware and software, and we'll... Uh, I'd like to know what you refer to as hardware and software and why. Well, are we on there? Yes. Well, it begins... 
Of course, with weaponry and uh, extensions of the hands and feet, uh, there is a sense in which the tools of man, clothing, any direct extension of the body <coughs> is hardware. The spoken word, uh, speech itself, involves all the senses at once. Hardware tends to fragment and specialize uh, the separate parts of the body as shoes, as uh, knives, as wheels. These are fragmentary extensions of the body. Speech is not a fragmentary extension of man. Speech is not hardware. Speak that I may see you is an old... Oh, well, it's a recent terminology from classified uh, catalogs of uh, Why is the industrial. Store, it's industrial. Is the hardware store a hardware store because it has catalogs that you can select material from? No, because it offers extremely specialized, separate, fragmented objects. That is hardware. The integral circuit of the electric is like our nervous system without fragmentation. It is, approaches the condition again of speech and of unity of man and, and involvement. Now, hardware, a speech is not hardware because it involves, it is not fragmentary and specialized. When it, ta when it, when it pr approaches the written form, then it breaks down into visual characteristics and components that are fragmentary and to that extent you get civilization and hardware. Civilization is based on hardware. Yeah. Of course, the point where you can take speech and put it into a book and create an object which exists in vacuo, as it were, that point you've got hardware because it is not necessarily an evolving principle. It's not the integral nature of the spoken word. But again, with electricity, the spoken word, Pete Seeks and Seeger style, or uh, in just plain uh, talky style, uh, this again returns us to the autonomy, the integral quality of the involved spoken word. And this is not hardware. Speech is so rich, so deep, every word contains all the senses at once. The Greek word for word is mythos, mythic, involving the totality of man. Uh, the very idea of the word, the logos, uh, is so involving of all the senses and of all knowledge that it has an integral character utterly alien to hardware. Hardware is specialism. It consists of written, the quill, parchment, wheels, knives, shoes, weapons, clothing, all kinds of specialized ways of extending and amplifying our physical powers. So the word is really exemplified by the Eastern idea of the, of the word home which contains all possible vocal sounds. And all words. Yeah, all words. Yeah. Now, if you ask where the word hardware came from, it uh, is an ant antithesis to the software, uh, software word invented by a computer technologist. The computer people, for just lack of any other vocable, hit upon software for programming of the nervous system into in new environments. They have the power with the computer to create new environments really made of our nervous systems. And since it is integral, such an environment is integral, total, it cannot be called hardware, which is specialist and fragmentary as a railway is, or a postal system, or a bureaucratic uh, organization of uh, officials, uh, hierarchically specialized and structured. The organization chart is very much the product of writing and hardware. The organization chart today dissolves. That's why the students will not bear having uh, President Kirk around. They don't want any hierarchies. They want to get involved in the process of decision making directly and totally. That's why the old civilized organization of separate private entities with separate private specialist powers will not bear up against the software, integral, instantaneous environment. So the interface between the old hardware and the new software has frantic and frenetic qualities. It wipes off the personality uh, or images of the individual kid growing up today. 
the ordinary child today growing up in a software in, environment and facing a hardware educational system can't bear the interface the abrasive interface of these two contrasting systems too much for him uh, who's our friend Marshall not Peter Drucker but the other fellow that we know very well Bernie Mullertime Bernie Mullertime you remember his story in his book uh, 10 years of management uh, revolution or whatever the name title was which tells the story of the Polaris <coughs> where uh, uh, the organizer on top of the thing instead of setting up a hierarchical principle in terms of production of this missile set up a series of sort of uh, transparent overlays of organization cells yeah one yeah one was concerned entirely with communication as a matter of fact making sure that everybody knew everything that was pertinent uh, to their particular job and also ensuring that all the possible information from around the world could be fed into this organization so it's a totally different principle uh, I think of organization and very oral and very tactile kinetic and not visual in the hierarchical sense well the old image of organization used the term staff in line borrowed from military structures and military structures were the sort of acme of literate hardware extended out into the uh, aggressive world of uh, operations and uh, staff in line won't hold up anymore under electric conditions when the people lowest down in the hierarchy can have access to just as much information as the president of the company at the same moment uh, that's what's creating uh, such a mess in, in our political lives uh, with TV every night becomes a election night a very funny example of the fact that the worker who for his company has electrical information coming in on teletype has availability for the same information that the boss has except Tony that the boss doesn't have time to pay attention to it or as the lower down character does and their boss is increasingly expendable and is increasingly a dropout the presidents of organizations of all sorts are now useless non-functional entities they don't have enough time to know what's going on they're not involved software eventually displaced all hardware uh, you can we, we are at this moment listening to a police siren which creates strange environment of <coughs> frenzy and alarm uh, pure software and um, uh, totally irrelevant to the um, environment that we live in but that's a sound that does create its own space that we very have. involving yeah creates a space around it the guys are going to have a coke or a cup of coffee somewhere so they turn on the siren and um, the um, principle of, of software as an extension of our own nervous system I think will stand up when you consider that all hardware all weaponry all tools and uh, instruments are extensions not of our nerves but of our physique our skin clothing our arms, knives, hammers, saws, swords, spears, and uh, wep uh, of course, when uh, weaponry goes into very high definition, I mean uh, clothing goes into very high definition, you have medieval armor, 